Thanks for coming. <laughs> Can you, is this microphone yeah. working? Okay. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is uh, tell you how much we appreciate you donating $3 each time. It pays the rent and it pays Eric, our technician. Eric, would you like... <laughs> So um, next month's show is uh, the third Friday of November. Anybody know what date that is? Everybody, get your phone out. What is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, already. Oh my God, October. And that show is an unusual show. Normally, Tripod stands for three presenters. And that show will be only one presenter. And it's because Marty Reese is coming. She's a Gig Harbor sculptor, a very successful one that has 45 minutes worth of uh, images and uh, talking about her process, how she gets commissions, and so forth. So that should be really interesting. So first up tonight is Dan Fear. Uh, he was born and raised in Tacoma, lived in the Seattle area for 30 years before moving back to Tacoma 15 years ago. He was the owner and director of Silver Image Gallery in Seattle from 1973 to 1993. That was a photography gallery. He has worked with art collectors, galleries, museums, and artists for more than 45 years. He has also organized and curated more than 270 exhibitions, including two museum exhibitions, and authored two art resource books, and consults on issues related to collecting art. 25 years ago, he started the website artcollecting.com and is still actively involved in it. The site is an online art resource featuring gallery and museum guides for 37 cities in all 50 states, if you can imagine maintaining that, and much more related to the art world. He's uh, promoted a lot of the Tacoma art projects. Just You could call him up and say, could you stick that on your website? So that he's been a big help to us here. Uh, tonight he is showing and talking about photographs he took of the Indian fishing wars back in 1974. The images were donated to the Puyallup tribe of Indians and loaned back for this presentation. Dan. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for... Uh attending tonight's presentation. The images I'm going to show were a witness to an event that happened in our backyard in Tacoma, Washington on September 9th, 1970. Eric? The fish wars, what they were, why they occurred, and how they ended. This was a major event, one of the, one of the biggest events to occur uh, in Northwest uh, Native American history. The Fish Wars were a series of civil disobedience protests by the Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest during the 1960s and 70s. The protests were coordinated by the tribes the goal was to pressure the U.S. government to recognize fishing rights granted by the Treaty of Medicine Creek. All of this occurred on the Puyallup River near the old Highway 99 bridge. The Treaty of Medicine Creek gave millions of acres of land in exchange for money, reservation, and access to traditional fishing rights. One of the key elements of it was it gave rights to the Native Americans to their usual and accustomed grounds for fishing. 
The tribe had a, an encampment in 1970 along the Puyallup River. This image shows proximate location. It was an encampment that lasted for about 30 days and had about 300 men, women, and children living in it. This is important to know because the Treaty of, End of Medicine Creek gave the rights to fishing for the Native Americans. And throughout the 18, late 1800s to 1960, they had to fight really hard to maintain these rights. The treaty was signed in 1854, just before Washington and Oregon became states. Chief Leshai of the Nisqually tribe protested the treaty and did not sign it, primarily because it did not include important Nisqually farming land. He and his people marched to Olympia to have their voices heard unsuccessfully, and this led to another important war, the Puget Sound War of 1855 and 56. In the 1960s, the tribe was fighting for recognition of their treaty rights. They were fighting poverty, they are fighting social issues, and they are fighting against the state, which was doing everything they could to deny those rights. In 1963, the fish in, fish in was held at Frank's Landing on the Nisqually River. Over the next few years, Billy Frank Jr., Robert Satyakam, Sid Mills, Don McLeod, and other fishers committed strategic and repeated arrests to bring public awareness of state laws. In 1964, Marlon Brando, a well-known actor and celebrity, got arrested with Minister John Yaron at a fish inn on the Puyallup River. Comedian Dick Gregory was also arrested at a fish inn and was given 30 days. However, he got early release because of a hunger strike. Up until that point, most fish inns were only one day long and didn't get too much publicity. In September of 1968, leaders of various nations got together and decided to have extended fish ins up to five days, and it gained a lot of attention, attention from other member organizations like the Washington Peace and Freedom Party, Students for a Democratic Society, Socialist Workers Party. Over the next few days, many uh, 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 public more and more publicity occurred. Back to the 1970 encampment, uh, there was a raid. About 300 law enforcement officers, game wardens, state uh, patrol, and other officers uh, raided the camp. There were guns pointed. A fire broke out. And at the end, more than 55 people were arrested, including five children. At this time, one of the observers of the camp was a U.S. attorney named Stan Pittman, and he got tear gassed along with many others at this camp. Five days later, Stan Pittman filed the case U.S. versus Washington, which eventually led to the George Bolt decision. The George Bolt decision was very important. It ruled the tribes were entitled up to 50% of the harvestable salmon and to become co-managers of the fishing resources. The ruling was upheld in 1979 by the Supreme Court.
at the encampment along the Puyallup, a local police chief warned that if they didn't clear it out, there would be a raid. Unfortunately, they couldn't do this because it is a native tribal land. What they managed to do is get somebody from the health department to say there was a health need uh, and it was unsanitary. And so they used that as their reason to raid the camp. Tear gas and guns were fired, but there were no injuries. The loaded, uh, they loaded buses up and took uh, the protesters to jail. Eventually, most of the protesters were released. as the Judge Bolt case continued. It lasted for more than three years. This would be one of the most uh, often used images that I gave to the tribe. Proof the guns were indeed pointed. Both sides apparently fired shots, although I have not been able to uh, actually document this. One of the reasons the railroad trestle was caught on fire was due to fire bombs, Molotov cocktails, as you might call. There's a proud officer showing off one of those Molotov cocktails. In 2011, I gave approximately 72 photographs to the Puyallup tribe, uh, and they provided me with about 34 for this presentation. Uh, not sure whatever happened to the rest of them. They were given to the Puyallup tribe's historic preservation department. They were given in the form of negatives, and so they process these uh, um, images that you see tonight. Many individuals were involved in this fishing war. One such individual was Billy Frank Jr. of the Nisqually tribe. He was first arrested in the early 60s as a 14-year-old. Overall, he was arrested more than 50 times. Other individuals involved was Hank Adams, an organizer. Ramona Bennett, a Puyallup tribal member that was in the camp in 1970. She, she eventually became a tribal leader and helped change the way women were perceived at the national uh, conference of tribal council presidents. Not sure who these are, but uh, it's winding down. These photographs were taken late in the day of the raid on the Indian encampment. Things got back to normal shortly after that, and they opened up the Highway 99 to traffic. I love seeing some of the old cars. So 
So today, Native Americans are still fighting for their tribal rights, their fishing rights. I'm going to go back to a statement that I read earlier. The, the Treaty of Medicine Creek guarantees the right to harvest fish, game, and other foods in usual and accustomed grounds located outside of reservation boundaries. During the 1960s, Washington State commercial fishermen and sports fishermen did everything they could to prevent Indian fishers from their treaty rights. After the Judge Bolt decision, it didn't end there. Tribes still have continued to fight for their rights to fish in their traditional lands. But more importantly, they're fighting for conservation of salmon habitat. I encourage all of you to research this further, look into it. It's a fascinating story that happened right here in our backyard, Tacoma, Washington. In 2019, the Puyallup tribe and city of Tacoma celebrated renaming of the Puyallup River Bridge, renaming it to the Fishing Wars Memorial Bridge. Many things have occurred from the time the treaty was signed until today. Again, I encourage you to research, look at it. I'll be handing out a resource sheet in a moment and uh, give you some additional details. Thank you. With, uh, I, they look like they're black and white, but they aren't really. Yeah, they, um, uh, I took them with a 35 millimeter camera, uh, and uh, they were donated to the Piaba tribe as black and white negatives. The images you saw tonight were provided to me by the tr courtesy of the Piaba tribe. And uh, it looks to me like they toned them somehow. I was wondering how you ended up there to cover the event. I lived very close to the Puyallup uh, River Bridge, and uh, my grandparents owned a fruit stand just on the Fife side of the river, and uh, I was living in that area at the time. And I, I believe I woke, got up one day and went to my mailbox, and I saw the bridge was closed and uh, that there was something going on. So I grabbed my cameras and head it out. Yeah, that's fine. Who's, who's next? In, hi, Dan. Um, in total, how many days was that? How many days did that go on? Well, the encampment lasted for about 30 days. And uh, after the uh, um, police chief said it was going to be raided, uh, it came down very quickly on uh, September 9th, 1970, uh, with about 300 uh, uh, officers uh, and game wardens participating in the raid. Those Molotov cocktails, were they thrown by the troopers? The Molotov cocktails... Um, were confiscated, as you could see in the pictures. Uh, the railroad trestle um, caught on fire. My understanding that there was gas poured onto the trestle uh, in retaliation for the raid, and uh, that Molotov cocktails were thrown to start the fire. Um, it's uh, several people have claimed to have started that, but uh, I have no names and wasn't able to identify those individuals. Dan? Was there move, uh, moving pictures made of the fish wars or, or uh, coverage, television screen coverage, television show coverage of it, news coverage? 
I'm sorry, I didn't. Was, was there any news coverage offered? Thank you, Claire. The whole object of the Indian fishing wars was to get arrested, to get publicity, and get the support of non-natives and the news media, both regionally and nationally. And there were a couple events that occurred before the September 9th um, raid of the camp, and uh, those garnered some publicity. Uh, getting actors like Marlon Brando, Dick Gregory involved, Jane Fonda was also involved here with Native American causes. Buffy St. Marie, a Canadian singer, was involved. Um, it was all about trying to get publicity to support their cause. And their, their reason is to gain their rights to the um, Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. And eventually, they got it through the Judge Bolt decision. By the way, the Bolt decision was very controversial, and uh, non-natives weren't particularly happy with it. Some Native Americans were not particularly happy with it. Um, Judge Bolt <laughs> came up with 130 pages, and he tried to cover and protect the Native Americans as much as he could. The one thing he couldn't do, there was one thing he couldn't do, and I don't know what it was, I'm sorry. But what he did in exchange of writing that into his decision was he managed to close every loophole that the state of Washington had to prevent Native Americans from their traditional rights. So Judge George Bolt did a really good job. And uh, uh, during that decision, uh, um, some of the tribes had their names officially written in the records for the first time. Uh, not the Pialpas and the Squalis, but, but some of the lesser known tribes. And uh, I believe there were seven or nine tribes that signed the Treaty of Medicine Creek. Can I have one more question? Dan, Dan um, what is the current status of fishing rights for the tribes here? The current status is the, uh, uh, the tribes have their rights from the treaties recognized. Um, and if you don't really understand treaty rights, uh, it's in the Constitution of the United States. States like Washington tried to overrule the Indian rights and the treaty rights illegally. The Supreme Court upheld that natives have their right to, to traditional fishing grounds. Today, they're still fighting primarily for conservation. And also, I'm proud to say the, uh, the Native Americans have uh, contributed greatly to the success of the current salmon restoration efforts and salmon recovery that is going on today. They are equal partners with the state, and they might even be better partners in the state. Uh, just thought I'd mention there's a documentary film that was made in 1971 that has the title As Long As the Rivers Run that's available online that is uh, focused on this, So, and it's pretty interesting to watch. It's, a, it's an excellent film. Um, the information I found online, particularly on YouTube, is very, very good. You can see that film in its entirety. There was a, a, a filmmaker in the camp during the uh, raid and also uh, in the days preceding it. And uh, there's, it's a wonderful film. Thank you, John, for mentioning that. Uh, there's other fisheries that are native and non-native uh, divisions uh, for quotas, such as halibut, black cod, clams, oysters. Was that written into the Bolt decision, or did that stem from, from the Bolt decision later on? I'm not sure. Um, each, e there were numerous tribes from uh, Native American tribes here in the Puget Sound region um, besides the Treaty of Medicine Creek, so I can't answer your question. 
I would like to say that the Puyallup tribe, now the historic preservation department in Fife has a, uh, a museum that's fascinating and I encourage all of you to go see that museum sometime. It's free Monday through Thursday. It's in Fife at, at their cancer center, uh, sort of right in between their two casinos, kind of. You can right. see it from the road. Thank you so much. So I want to do Anna Thurston. Do you want to stand up and turn around so people can see what you look like? Uh, she's been volunteering to help organize these tripod shows, and it's pretty labor-intensive begging people to do these labor-intensive productions, and we appreciate you guys a lot. So the lights are so bright, I can't see Claire Petridge, who has some information to share with you. Claire, do you want to stand up and come forward? cities and this year we're this is our 21st year to have a, a film festival international film festival this year the focus is international indigenous peoples from around the world from our sister countries so I just I have a I have a save the date card for you and I'll just pass them around on both sides thank you I hope to see you there it's at the grand on on November 7th 8th and 9th amazing films Dan I hope you'll come back Great. So, uh, mark your calendar also for October 20th, third Friday, tripod, sculptor Marty Reese. So, make note of that. Um, there's a sign-up sheet back there. If you're not getting the emails advertising these shows, put your uh, email address on that uh, clipboard. It's on that table back there. Anna? I would add that we also have a Facebook page. And um, Mark Monlux and myself have been uh, trying to steer you into a new one. And that uh, old one is going to end at the end of the year. So if you're getting messages through the old one, you might know who it is. Um, try and get to the new one. Uh, we're going to try and narrow it down so it all is under one name. And you'll keep getting our messages. It'll be good. Thank you. Anna's such a hard worker. She's been writing, rewriting the Constitution for putting together the tripod slideshows. <laughs> you didn't know it was that hard, did you? Okay, next up are uh, Tim Martin and A.J. Beeman, who met surreptitiously. Um, on the number 20 bus while on their way to the first day of film school at Olympic College in Bremerton in 2018. They ended up in several of the same classes and have been sharing stories, writing screenplays, and making films ever since. The generation gap has turned out to be a valuable advantage. Contrasting backgrounds, different perspectives, Tastes in music, food, and worldview have made their creative work together a dynamic, free-flowing adventure. They've recently formed a film production company called... Kinetosphere. For some reason, my printer did... It's just a big blank right there. <laughs> say, say it loud, Tim. And they have several viable projects in development. So you two want to come up and present? We think they're viable. So uh, when Lynn asked me to present the uh, information I had collected
on a visit to the, the powwow celebrations at uh, Daybreak Star uh, Center in Seattle. I was very excited uh, also to learn that there were other presenters that were going to have uh, information, uh, not the same subject, but the same people. And uh, I've always had a deep wound in my heart for how much grief and degradation and uh, you know just the effort that the US government made to annihilate uh, these wonderful people. And so the information that you're going to see in our presentation is actually in the form of a film. Uh, we decided that what we had was important enough, so we spent many, many hours putting something together so that we could in incorporate everything that we wanted to say within the time limit that we had. So. You can start our film now, Eric. You never forget who you are or where you come from. Be proud. The animals we wear, the feathers, the buckskin, the quills. We always pray to them for they sacrifice their life for us to wear. Never forget them.
My name is Randy Lewis. Pleased to meet everyone here. Uh, my name is Kayahan, or Randy, whichever one you prefer. Where am I from? <clears throat> well, I'm an original Wenatchee Indian in Pascosa. My roots go back here 12,000 years. I mean, I couldn't be more a part of this city than, but I didn't grow up all the time here. So that's another story. You know, when I moved to Wenatchee, moved back to Wenatchee four years ago, I didn't have any idea of what really I was going to do. But then I was, I was recruited to uh, teach Native American classes up at Columbia Elementary. I ran into some of the, uh, one of the families, the uh, Abuelo, uh, Jose Luis, and his two grandsons. I didn't realize they were brothers. Nobody told me they were brothers. And he'd been raising them. And he walked up, and the, the boys came, Jose Luis and Armando, they come running up to me, and they were hollering at me. They were talking to me in Indian. And the grandfather comes up, and he introduced himself in my dialect, in Indian. And I'm going, wow. And he said, uh, yeah, my, my grandson. They hate school. They don't like school. But now they love school. They love school because they like going to their classes, their Indios classes. And they come home and they teach me every day. I said, that's, that's great. And so I thought about that and I'm going, wow, talk about making a difference. Kids who didn't like school previously, prior, love it because of the in cultural enrichment they're getting from Native classes. So that's one of the things that motivates me in the morning, knowing that what I may consider as insignificant or as small potatoes really is making an impact. different places all of the video I took and all of the still images are from Jack Storms who has attended 20 years of powwow and he gave me access to 50,000 images <laughs> that I went that I went through one by one and uh, AJ and I ultimately curated what you were able to see at the we chose the images that we felt would most dramatically uh, demonstrate uh, the, the depth and power uh, of not only the regalia that they wear, but just the whole culture and, and how they celebrate together. Uh, Randy Lewis, the man who was interviewed there, he's the one that uh, suggested the title, More Than Bows and Arrows. I thought it was really a, apropos. But, uh, it was non-native people AJ and I obviously are not native people. 
at least not this, not the, the Native American culture. I, I just felt like I needed to step aside. And uh, I was so, so fortunate to know Randy. He's been a friend of mine for 35 years. And he introduced me to Jack Storms. And so we were able to have access to those really high quality uh, images. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it because we really had fun uh, putting it together. And uh, as it says, or it did say, um, I couldn't get the exact date, but if anyone wants to attend the, the powwow next year, it's always during Seafair in July. And it's three days, and about 10 to 15,000 uh, Native people come from all over uh, the Canada and the U.S. And then there's also a lot of, you know, of course, visitors that, that come and, uh, and help celebrate. So maybe we'll see you there. But maybe somebody else has a question tonight. One more question. Yes. A, a question about the photography. It looked to me like you had lined up, I don't know if you guys did it, but the heads so that when you it changed, the, the head was still in the same place from picture to picture. It was pretty... That yes, was I took a lot of liberty with the photos. I tried to show kind of a... Well, me and Tim both agreed that uh, there's many generations at the powwow, and so I tried to take sort of younger faces and older faces uh, in similarity with some of the shots. So that's that was the idea behind that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah AJ did all the editing. Yeah, much better at premiere than I am. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So some of you have participated in the past in the shows we have uh, had at Tripod that are collaborative. So we had one show called Reading in Bed. Was anybody in this room in that show, John and Claudia and Jennifer, Jory, Rick? I can't really see who's out there, Jennifer, Mars. You weren't in that show. And then we had another one. Um, I forget what the title was. Maybe something like quirky things about Tacoma. And these were photographs that people in the audience took and then they emailed to me of weird architecture. Was anybody here uh, participating in that show? Yep. Yeah, I know I found a lot of quirky pictures to take in Tacoma. So we're thinking about doing another collaborative show, and we usually assemble the images for a couple of months before we actually show them. And it's, uh, well, it might be more than 50 images for a special project like that. So uh, we're thinking of asking each of you to submit a really good photograph of yourself, and then a really horrible, you know, that uh, it just makes you go, where the heck did they get that awful picture of me, Rick and Jory? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about that? Do you think you could participate in that? We can't do it without your participation. <laughs> what? Yeah, so you'd see the good version and then the horrible version. Well, I mean, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to see mine. Anyway, now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, Philip H. Red Eagle began shooting a small 35 millimeter cannon while in country Vietnam back in 1971. He purchased a Canon QL rangefinder at the Cholon Exchange in Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. Later, when back in the fleet in 72 and 73, he bought a Canon F1 35 millimeter SLR camera, top of the line. Some of you know what this means. <laughs> I almost do. Once back in the States and stationed in San Diego, Philip took photography classes at San Diego City College. 
he also started taking wedding pictures for his buddies. He came to the University of Washington in 1976 and continued his education and his camera expertise, moving to professional levels in the 80s, shooting headshots and doing model portfolios and ad photography, moving to gallery level photography in the early 90s. He has currently started digitizing his old slides and black and white work and is now shooting with a Sony digital camera. Philip is born and raised, is a born and raised Northwest writer, artist, metalsmith, and carver. He is the author of Red Earth, A Vietnam Warrior's Journey, styled in mythical realism and now in uh, its second edition, saltpublishing.com. Maybe he'll tell you more about that. He is also the originator and a co-founder of the Raven Chronicles, a journal of art, literature, and the spoken word from 1991 to the present, currently based in Seattle. The Raven Chronicles is now 27 years old. Philip is an occasional poet who, these days, spends most of his time working with tribal journeys a cultural movement using the canoe as a vessel for cultural re renewer, renewal. Philip. This is the first black and white picture I took in Vietnam at Na Bay. I was there for a year and a half, and uh, I wanted to start with this. And uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time with it, but it's one of the few peaceful images <laughs> I got out in Vietnam. And uh, what's going on here? There's, this is a year later up out in the fleet when I'm going back to Vietnam for my third trip. I did two offshore trips, and in between I did Vietnam tour on the river. And I really started taking pictures at that time. There you go. Keep it dark. Yeah. And then I got out, and uh, when I got out in 76, I went home, and I started perfecting what I had been trying to do. And this is in Sitka, Alaska, looking west. And uh, it's slide film, Kodachrome. That's uh, Sitka was not a very big town then. It was only about 3,000 people. This is one of the local plants. It's a medicine plant in Sitka. And this is a um, kind of a contrast between the sky and, and what's not the sky. <laughs> You know, that's the moon. It's a moonshot. So I was kind of getting artsy. This is looking at Mount Edgecombe, that little volcano we saw in the background in the third, sec, third film, third piece. And I call this one Strata. Kodachrome. This is in Seattle. And... Uh, First Avenue, doesn't look like that anymore. And uh, you can see that. I just walk in there and I notice this uh, uh, 
This character on the on the left is amazed that somebody's changing his uh, <laughs> covering up his, his uh, advertisement. I call it no. <laughs> this one's called uh, framed. When they were first building that building, I was downtown and I took this picture, very artsy. This is on campus at the UW, and that tower on the lower part is uh, ventilation, where everything is underneath red square, and this is an obelisk, 35 millimeter kodachrome. Oops. And this is the opposite direction in front of Suzalo. And that's the obelisk. And that shadow is that, uh, that tower. Tri X film, black and white. This is Joanne. She, Joanna, she's from Tacoma. She was at the UW. Wanted to model, so I did some headshots for her. She's a teacher somewhere. <laughs> I couldn't remember her name for the life of me. And we used to hang out in the photo lab together at the UW Communication School, School of Communications. She was into photography as well, and she wanted to do some modeling on the side. This is Jennifer. This is Angie Moore. Her father was a football player. This is, um, uh oh, I'm forgetting her name. Oh, look. Jolene. And she was part of a work, a project I was doing called the Kimono Series. And I gave her a print of this and she got it framed, put it on her wall. <laughs> They're all grandmas by now, you know. This is 40 odd years ago. This is Kathleen, or Catherine, Catherine. She moved on into porn. <laughs> like the camera, I guess. Anybody know this young lady? Her name was Julia Sweeney. Very bright young woman. You know her as Pat on Saturday Night Live. This is her in 1979. She used to work at the Varsity Theater on the Ave. This is uh, Deborah Magpie Erlane, and uh, she showed me her manuscript back there in 79. Now it's a book. I got to read this 43 years ago, 44 years ago, <laughs> before it became a book. And she used it on the cover of her poetry. Okay, I shoot men too. We did a calendar called Ladies' Nights, and that's the guy who produced it. And it was all uh, black men, black calendar in 83. This is uh, Ken Jackson on the left interviewing uh, James Welch, also a Native American writer. Um, See, Death of Jim Loney, Winter in the Blood, Fool's Crow, and several other books. He taught at the University of Montana for a long time. He was, he was there at the UW, <coughs> I think it was 81, 
And I took a class from him. I took two classes from him. This is Jim Schopert. And uh, if you're driving east, uh, west on uh, 90, and you come off the floating bridge, that's his work on the side of the entrance to the tunnel. He died in 94 from a heart attack. Kodachrome, rustic, that's the title of this one. Fall, bright fall. I like flowers. This is 1984, Geneva, Switzerland, that we have put up an exhibit at the main Fourier of the UN building in the summer of 84. And uh, we were there for six weeks. And going there for six weeks started my political career. Um, I got to talk and meet with the indigenous people from around the world because they were having a human right, uh, uh, sessions on human rights, indigenous human rights. When I got back, I felt empty. So I felt that we needed to get it going again. Eventually wound up being the canoe movement. This is one of the streets. It's called Shiny Bright. French for shiny and bright. <laughs> in Geneva. I like signs. This is a young woman. She was a security guard at the UN. Very tall, elegant woman. She came walking through the exhibit one day and I said, I waved her over and I said, hey, can I photograph you? And she says, and she was from Vienna. She said, why do you need, why do you want to photograph me? You know? I said, because you're beautiful. And she said, okay. <laughs> Swan dive. This is on Lake Geneva. The other name was Butt Up. This is um, some countryside at Fort Peck Reservation called the Badlands. Tri-X in the mid 80s. This is UW campus. I was getting into flowers and shapes and whatever, I, whatever got in front of me. It's downtown Tacoma, it's gone as well. I mean, Seattle, in Seattle, First Avenue. It's a contrast. <laughs> that the Japanese garden with the arboretum. That's Hana Wire, she's Japanese. And it's a black and white shot with a hand painted, hand, I hand painted that one, the colors. This is that waiting for the inner urban. <laughs> but my title is waiting with the regulars. Uh, this is 1988, and uh, it was shot at 3.30 in the morning. She really wanted to get her, some images together, so we, we asked her to do this, and she went for it. Her name was Michelle. I don't think it's her real name. I saw her in the news a few years ago, and it wasn't Michelle. Michelle. 
a drunk walked through. I said, how you doing, dude? <laughs> he didn't even see her. <laughs> this is her again. Solve for X. This is the opener of digital. This is when I shipped it to digital. All the other works for film. Blue Heron, that Green Lake, 2012. This is uh, Bob Satyakum. I saw his name, Robert Satyakum, up there. That's not his name. I always called him Bob. His son is Robert. <laughs> but that was his smoke shop there where the casino is now. Wolf Creek. about the contrast, Montana. This is Bella Bella. And you can see the little face in it, right? Can you see the face? That's God looking down, I think. 2014, Bella Bella. This is our Presbyterian church right over here. I waited two years for that image. To, I saw it one year and I didn't have a camera. So it took me two years to get it back again. I waited that long. <laughs> this is a crescent lake. Just called blue. This is called Blue Jay Brings Back the Moon. See the form line of the blue jay? in the clouds. And that's a Salish story about the, when the, we lost the moon and Blue Jay went and got it. That was at Chiquamish. You know where this is. We never could figure out what it said. I just took this Tuesday, Tuesday night. I had to wait for the cars to clear out. But there are two cars sitting in the back, and I, and I, I put it into uh, iPhoto and took them out. This is called Saul Etude. That's 2014 up in Campbell River on Vancouver Island, and that's the year they had all the big fires. And that smoke triggered my asthma. That's the sun. <laughs> this one I call Little Heads. And if you look on the upper canoe, you can see between the polars, there's a whole bunch of little people. See their heads? And a little girl here on the front of this canoe. That's where we're at. The children are there. Very important. It was so foggy, the sun took the bridge. That's out by uh, the utilities place where you pay your bills. See the sun on the bridge? Yeah. It was lucky, lucky day. This is just before it closed. I wanted to take a picture of it, so I gave them to the, 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 the two brothers and the sister that worked there. They inherited it from their father. My father helped build this back in the 40s and 50s. He was a carpenter. It's the first nude in 33 years. It's the blue moon up in the U District in Seattle. My signs. And 
And this is the, um, I call them the uh, Shell, House, <coughs> Shell House Osprey. This was just a couple months ago on Lake Washington on campus. Got 15 minutes? I wanted to say, uh, in particular, two shots were just amazing. The one called Frame and the one called Rust. Yeah, Rusty. Really, yeah, stunning. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Um, can you tell me something about the organization, Tribal Journeys? Tribal Journeys? Yeah. Yes. Um, this is the ring from the journey. Could you repeat the questions, please? Uh, she asked about tribal journeys. And we did a show a couple years ago here on tribal journeys. And uh, it's a movement that came out of the 1980s, and, and uh, we started structuring it in the early 90s. And then we experimented with it in 95 and 96 with Tom Heidelbaum. And, uh, we go by the 10 rules of the canoe, and Sam here was, uh, what was that uh, organization again? The Association for Experiential Education, it was a West chapter. It was a conference here in Tacoma in 1990. And Tom and David Forlein presented the 10 rules of the canoe there. And you can go online and look for 10 rules of the canoe, and you can see what they are. We're going, uh, we're going on 33 years here, working on this. I actually started in 84, after coming back from Geneva. And it was a big struggle. Until I met Tom, and I started going with this. It took me a while to get into digital. I, uh, I couldn't focus anymore through an SLR, single lens reflex. And uh, something with my glasses. Since then, they, they changed the, how they make glasses and I can could, I could focus now. But I've already shifted to digital. I use a Sony. Uh, it's my new 35 millimeter. And like I say, it, it took that picture of the of uh, Frisco Freeze two nights ago at 11 o'clock. I got there right at 11. Make sure the light was on. But you know, imagery is imagery, no matter how you arrive. And at one time we used to paint the imagery, and then we take make was it. 1838, when they invented photography, that changed the whole world of imagery. But I like, I like it all. Uh, I was wondering about your childhood in photography. Did you have any experience with cameras when you were a kid? And my mom, she took pictures all the time. She has a thousand pictures. I started digitizing them, and I got into like 400, and I still have like several hundred to go <laughs> from the old days. I was going to say about the fishing rights thing is um, in 47, I remember my mom and dad picking me up across the rails, going to the berm on the Puyallup River, and there were a line of, um, what do you call them, uh, they weren't police, they were... Um, Fisheries people trying to keep us from getting the salmon from the river. And we got him, we got it, and then we went up and cooked it. Uh, where the graveyard is now, there used to be a baseball field on the upper graveyard of the Puyallup tribe. Philip, will you tell us about your totem on your, on your neck piece, please? Your art, uh, your 
your piece of art on your neck piece, what you're wearing. This is copper ring. ring ceremony. Copper ring for the copper ring ceremony, which is, uh, we wanted to have an object which is the connection to the 10 rules of the canoe. And you wore it around your neck. So this is your connection to the 10 rules of the canoe. <clears throat> and you add to that every year? We add, yes. It's on backwards. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else questions? So one for every journey. You have one. Tammy back here has wears wearing a ring. I had a quick question. Um, at speaking of journeys, your first image is absolutely beautiful. And I was curious um, if your experience in Vietnam, if you wanted to speak a little to it and how it might have influenced any of your photography, especially when you came back. I lost hearing in Vietnam. Could you speak to your experience in Vietnam? Do you feel comfortable sharing that experience? I have PTSD. Uh, um, I meant in, in uh, like regards to your photography, did you did it consciously influence your photography? Or when you came back, did you find yourself immersing in photography even more? I just found an interest in taking some of the things that happened there. And, uh, and then I started finding the beauty. Um, I do have some combat pictures, but you know, what, the thing about combat is you're not supposed to be taking pictures. <laughs> supposed to be doing combat. <laughs> so there's almost no pictures of any of that. But I do have PTSD. I go to my vet's group every week. And um, my hearing's getting worse. <laughs> Probably noticed. <laughs> Yeah, I've always liked that picture. I, I, it just, there's something about it. Yeah. Maybe that moment of peace. Yeah. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I've got one more question for you. It's, it's like peace and contrast, that photograph. But yeah. the question was, What's the name of that book that you read this, the copy of before it was published? Oh, Perma Red. Perma Red? Yeah. Was there a reason why it was Please repeat the title. Please repeat the title. Please repeat the title. Please repeat the title. Perma Red. Two words. Her name is Deborah Magpie Erling. She's uh, Salish from uh, the lake of Montana. <laughs> What's that reservation? Do you know that reservation in Montana, the Salish people? Yes. No, it's but above, I grabbed the book. <laughs> yeah, you find out from the book it's based on the, on the reservation life. I have uh, one more question for you. Uh, when you see an image or when you're taken to uh, to take a photo, sort of like this first one here with the big commanding U.S. ship over the smaller Vietnamese fishing boat, or even with uh, the church in the moon. Do you ever see thematic uh, imagery and that's why you take the photo, or is it more just uh, things align and you and you take a shot and, and things happen afterwards? It's, a moment. it's just the moment that attracts you. Hmm. Actually, I have, I could probably do a five hour <laughs> show with all the images that I've taken. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay.
Eric, could you put the spotlight on that, please? <laughs> So uh, sometimes I I bring trinkets to give away, and this I I found in my collection of stuff. It might be a shepherd, and he's supposed to be on a camel. It's actually a beautiful little cast plastic piece. I'd like to find a home for it. <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> oh come on. <laughs> oh good, AJ will take it. Good. A round of applause. And the next thing, this is a little more practical. AJ's seen that up close, so he knows what a treasure it is. So this is a set of oil paints, and they're not all dried out or anything. They're perfectly good. Is there anybody here that can take these? Rick, you want them? <laughs> Yay! We've got to take our good. A round of applause, please. So we'll see you October 20th for the next show. Thank you so much for supporting these shows. Anna, you have something to say? Don't forget, don't forget that Tacoma Arts Month is coming up in October. And it's many studios. I think some of you are in the show. Me. Anybody other, uh, who else has a, uh, a studio that you'll be giving open tours to? Raise your hands and so let us see. Look online, Tacoma Art <laughs> Tour to figure out where we'll be. Okay, thanks everybody. So there are several of us here in the audience also who would like you to mark your calendar for the first Saturday in December and put it on your calendar to come to the Mountaineers in Old Town where how many of us? 17 last year. 16 of us will be uh, selling our creations. That's right. Teresa Owen, Sherilyn Bruce, Ann Darling, and myself. It's really nice stuff. I was there last year and I spent a lot of money. <laughs> it was fun. First Saturday of December. At the Mountaineers building. Uh, 30th Street, Old Town, Tacoma. You know, almost everybody here is on the email when I send out invitations to Tripod. And I don't share that list with anybody, but I just might email you the details of that December 2nd show we're talking about. It's my list. I can do it well with it. <laughs> okay.